The word samurai means to serve. This is the most fundamental purpose of a samurai, to serve and be loyal to their daimyo. A samurai without a master is a ronin, a vagabond, and a disgrace. Some ronin, known as aramusha, strike out on their own, fighting for causes they feel passionately about, or perhaps merely seeking answers to the questions they raise about their own path or existence. Even so, Aramusho were not admired or respected by the people of the mire, regardless of their reasons for leaving their masters. Even the shinobi of the shadows were better off than ones who disobeyed or dishonored their masters. Ichizo had, without question, dishonored his master. But in doing so, he'd gained for himself an even greater honor. Born to the esteemed Tachibana family, Ichizo was destined for greatness. The eldest son, he was taught how to fight from the time he was able to walk. He grew fast, sharp, and keen. His father, once referred to him as an unsheathed sword, aimed at the world. This was not mere hyperbole, as Ichizo was incredibly fierce in combat. During sparring sessions, he was taught to battle as if the enemy was surrounding him, taught to think it was a fight to the death, taught to strike without reservation until told otherwise. Because when a Tachibana is confronted with an enemy, they do not sheath their swords until the enemy lies dead. They are a cutting wind against the foes of the mire. The daimyo of Hoto province, Sozen Buntaro, was quite impressed with Ichizo, even seeing him as potential Hatamoto material in the future. Ichizo was honored, thrilled at the opportunity, but first he had to earn that privilege to be named Hatamoto, and that opportunity would come at his 25th birthday. Ichizo sat beside his father in the estate of their liege lord, who was sipping his sake slowly in the manner normal of such a gathering. The three families under Buntaro were in attendance. The Tachibana, of course, but also the Urameshi and the Moto. All three were respectable samurai families, all three known, and all three loyal to Buntaro and the Sozen. But it seemed that today their skills and loyalty would be tested. Buntaro explained to them the grim nature of the battle that lay ahead of them. As I'm sure you know, Buntaro explained, Horkos, the lamentable cowards, have invited more savages from beyond the seas to our lands who now raise havoc and confusion amongst us. No one spoke, but all eyes were on their liege lord. Their silence was confirmation enough for him to continue. These most recent gaijin are dark-skinned, adorned in feathers, skulls, and animal hides, crawling around like wild beasts caked in mud and grime. They howl like the possessed, and they strike with club and spear. Again, none spoke, but all knew the rumors of these ocelots. After their siege of Vela's fortress, they have been seeking territory to claim as their base of operations. They have set their sights on the mire, our home. The Emperor has ordered we stay vigilant, keep a watch at our borders. But I say we take the fight to these animals. You do not wait for the wild dogs to eventually wander into your home. You hunt them and you kill them. Am I not correct? You are, sire. A member of the Urameshi said quickly. But my lord, a member of the Moto offered, the rumors say they laid waste to the fortress of Vela. Is it wise to seek them out if they are that formidable? Vela was a foolish woman, as was her entire retinue, Buntaro snapped impatiently. Besides, they took her with the element of surprise. We shall merely use their own tactic against them. He leaned forward and spoke gravely. We have information that these savages have taken control of three small villages, Izu, Machi, and Hoshi. I will be sending you in three separate forces to hit these villages and liberate them. Sire, Ichizo finally spoke up. Izu, Machi, and Hoshi are villages of the neighboring region. Shouldn't their own daimyo deal with them? Normally, yes, Botaro nodded. But it would seem that my dear neighbor has failed in his duties to defend his province. For the sake of the Maya, we will not allow the Empire to fall to these barbarians. He then stood up and spoke loudly and clearly. Your orders are to go to the villages of Izu, Machi, and Hoshi and kill all the savages within. Do your duty. The orders were given and Ichizo was sent with the forces to liberate Izu. When they arrived, the bright autumn trees contrasted against the gray, overcast sky, allowing the soldiers to see clearly all through the forest. Ichizo expected an ambush, an attack of some kind. But to his surprise, the trek to Izu was met with almost no resistance, or even a sign of the ocelotal warriors. 
The men talked at length about the savages from across the sea, that they wore animal skins because they forgot how to be human, that they rip out the organs of humans and eat the remains, bones and all, that they catch fish for fornication before eating. The stores and tales were more wild than the last, and in time even Ichizo was laughing along with the troops, until they arrived, and the Hatamoto in charge of their attack force raised his hand. Attack! Take the town! Ichizo charged into the village gates to the sound of shouts, screams, and blood, and as his sword tasted his first target, he realized it was not an ocelot, but an obushi, wearing the colors of the neighboring lord. He looked up to see if he'd made a mistake, but he had not. There were no ocelot that he could see. No savage warriors, no animal pelts, not even a sign of their presence. Only samurai and peasants of the mire. And yet the attack force cut into them with a vicious will. Men and women were cut down, and the elderly were slaughtered. Ichizo watched his comrades mercilessly rip apart the village. Mate! Mate! Yamuro! His command to stop fell on deaf ears. He looked to the commander, a, k- a kinsei, standing there proudly as he watched the carnage. Ichizo staggered to him. Sir, stop this barbarism! Something is wrong! There is no wrong here. We were ordered to liberate Izu. We're doing it. But the enemy's not here. There's no enemy to slay, Ichizo cried. I don't even see evidence of them ever being in this town. Instead of explaining himself, the Hatamoto glared at Ichizo. Are you defying an order from our liege lord, he demanded. Sir, you are samurai, Tachibana Ichizo. Samurai serve their lords. Now we shall do our duty. Sire, my duty is to the Maya, and you forget your place. The Hatamoto drew his sword, and Ichizo drew his own. For a moment, the fighting ceased as the two warriors sized each other up. You will be punished for this, my lord Buntoro. And I'll accept it, Ichizo cried. But these people are not savages. They're fellow samurai and Maya citizens. If I'm to kill them, I must know why. You kill because Buntoro Dono orders it. You kill because your liege lord has told you to do so, and you will bring shame on your name and your family for your disobedience. Our orders were to kill the savages in these villages, each though snarled. But where are the ocelotl? I don't see them. To this, the kensei suddenly gave a very cold smile. What ocelotl? he asked. Our orders, very specifically, were to kill the savages. Don't you remember? And it was then that it finally struck Ichizo. Buntaro had never said to kill Ocelotl. He'd said to kill savages. This wasn't a defensive maneuver. It was a false flag tactic. Buntaro wanted these villages and this land. He wanted to expand his territory. He was creating the fabricated pretense that these lands were held by enemy forces, and thus he was liberating them. The dead villages were mere casualties. It was all a ploy. A dirty and underhanded maneuver to steal from the neighboring lord. Cowards! You're lesser than Eita! The Ichizo roared, raising his sword against the Kensei. You act as a savage, and now I shall follow my orders and kill you savages! The Kensei rushed him, raising the long Nodachi blade. Ichizo dashed to the side of the strike and then pivoted, bounding forward and slashing across the Kensei's stomach armor. The Lamellar lessened the blow, but the wind had been knocked from the Kensei's lungs. Ichizo prepared for the final blow, but another warrior of the Urameshi clan attacked to defend the Hatamoto. Ichizo raised his sword and knocked down the sudden Orochi charge, and then kicked back his aggressor. Another Orochi rushed, and this time Ichizo slashed, cleaving his elbow from his arm. The disarmed Orochi screamed, and Ichizo silenced him by impaling him through the throat. He then reached down and picked up the fallen sword, wielding two katana at once, and holding them out in either direction. One at the Kensei, and one at the other samurai come to apprehend him. You have betrayed Buntaro Dono, the Kensei bellowed. You are a disgrace to your clan and your liege lord. So be it. I don't serve Eita trash, Ichizo bellowed. Kill him! Wielding the two swords, Ichizo flew into a frenzy. A Naginata came down on his head, and he knocked back the strike with both swords, before kicking the Nobushi backwards. He then charged and impaled a Shugoki through the gut, then used his second sword to slash his throat, letting the large warrior collapse to the ground. A shinobi tried to take advantage of his distraction by attacking from behind, but the leaping assassin was unable to change his trajectory as Ichizo spun and swung his blades in a high arc, cleaving the arm and chest from the shinobi, leaving him to collapse on the ground. One after another he was attacked, harassed, and struck, 
but Ichijo did not relent in his vicious self-defense. However, twas in vain. At long last, he felt the rude weight of a Kanabo crash into his side, and he rolled with the blow, laying on the ground, growling furiously. As lonely fall leaves drifted and fell about his body, he saw them get crushed under the feet of his enemies. Foolish brat, the Hatamoto growled. Death is too kind for your sins. I will see to it you are left as nothing but a ronin, masterless and empty. Ichizo cringed at the words, the highest dishonor, to be stripped of his place as a samurai, to become nothing more than a ronin. And yet he did not regret his course of action. He knew it was right, even if it defied the honor to his liege lord. Break him and let's move on. The samurai surrounded Ichizo, and he closed his eyes to receive his punishment. His blood stained the already crimson leaves an even deeper red. When Ichizo opened his eyes, his world was one of pain and agony. However, as he started to lift himself, he suddenly became aware that he was not alone. There were people walking around this village, and he wasn't laying on a muddy and bloody field anymore, but rather he was on a cot of silk. A sheet draped over him, and he had been moved inside of a house within the village. An obushi knelt beside him, pouring cha into a cup for him. He groaned and looked up at her, and she smiled. Good morning, she said. I'm glad you're well, Tachibana-san. Where am I? he asked. You are in Izu, the place you attempted to protect, she answered. When news reached us that the village was being attacked, my lord rode here with his forces as quickly as he could. The survivors told us of your deeds, and we are all in your debt. She bowed low until her head touched the mat, and each of them looked away. I'm no longer samurai, and I no longer have a master. What I did shamed my family, and my name. Leave me. I cannot. I said leave. I cannot. Why will you not follow this order? With all due respect, I'm not following your orders. I'm obeying my liege lord. And to disobey him, as you well know, is dishonorable and shameful. Ichizo rose furiously. You mock me! Never, Tachibana-san. I am not Tachibana! I am... I am Ronin! He sank back on his cot and stared at the ceiling. She bowed again. If you insist I leave, then I shall fetch my master at once. She bowed and left the room as Ichizo didn't move a muscle. He simply lay there, angry. He was angry at Buntaro for his cowardly and underhanded move to seize land and power. He was, that, he was mad at that Hatamoto and his underlings for so blindly agreeing to Buntaro's orders. But more than that, he was angry at himself for his disobedience. Why had he let morality cloud his actions? For a samurai, there is only one right and wrong. Right is obedience, and wrong is disobedience. It didn't matter if what your master did was evil or wicked. Your job was merely to obey and let his karma be his karma, and your obedient karma be your own. Yet he'd acted as the fools of Ashfeld and Valkenheim. He was an idiot, betraying his master, betraying every principle of the samurai, and he deserved to be ronin. That fool woman should have known better than to disgrace him in this way. After a long period, the doors opened, and in walked the daimyo. The one that all of the mire knew as the Black Dragon, Richard Blackthorn, adorned in his heavy lawbringer armor. He was the most strange daimyo of them all, a knight who had earned the respect and trust of a whole province for him single-handedly fighting Horkos and defending the innocent civilians. He sat down and sat in a manner befitting his station. Are you well? he asked. His Japanese was excellent for a foreigner. I'm well enough, Ichizo answered. This is good, he answered. I feared the worst when I saw you. This village is in your province? It is, and I thank you for your part in defending it. Your deeds allowed many civilians to escape. I was warned of this treachery by Buntaro thanks to them. Ichiro noticed that Richard did not use San when referring to Buntaro. A clear insult. A part of him bristled. The other part wanted to smile. Do not thank me. I betrayed my lord for this. I ask that you permit me to leave and wander as a ronin. Well, you hardly need my permission for that, Richard answered. Then you understand? Frankly, no, Richard chuckled. <laughs> you samurai. I've been a daimyo now for some four years, and I still struggle to comprehend your ideology. So steadfast in your devotion and obedience that you sacrifice your own individuality. Well, you're a gaijin, a foreigner. I don't expect you'll ever truly be one of us, Ichizo snarled. He was goading Richard, hoping the insult would make him angry and maybe offer him death. But Richard only shrugged. Perhaps not. 
and yet this whole province acknowledges me as their liege lord. Why do you suppose that is? Because they're fools? Or maybe because they value the man who put them before himself, Richard responded. A man's obedience is truly honorable and worthy of admiration, but the man who puts his own honor on the line for someone else's life? Well, there can be no greater form of honor than that. You speak foolishness that you pretend it's wisdom, each of snarled. How often wisdom and foolishness mirror each other, Richard contemplated. In any case, I have no interest in debating the matter with you. I wanted to thank you for what you've done for my people. If you wish to thank me, each of whispered, allow me the right to commit seppuku. Richard shrugged. As you wish, he stood up, but only after you're well enough to raise a knife to your stomach. Each of looked at him with surprise as he turned to walk away. I thought your knightly religion forbade suicide, and that you'll let me do so. Your ways aren't mine, Tachibana-san, Richard replied. If you believe death will grant you honor, then you may have it. But to me, what honor could be gained in death pales next? But to me, what honor could be gained in death pales next to honor that could be earned by the living. Richard then walked out of the room. The Nobuchi was kneeling by the door, and she bowed as well before closing it behind her. She must have been a servant of his house. Rumor had it that Richard had taken a samurai woman and his wife, but even then, each of thought this was incomprehensible, because Richard understood so little. And yet, his words would not leave each of mind, and his dreams were not restful, as he dreamed of two large dragons glaring down at him, one large, imposing in red, the color of Buntaro Sozen, the other cold and serene but black. Both were imploring him to follow them as they both began to drift away, and Ichizo was struggling to decide which dragon he wanted to trust. Blackthorn had been able to save Izu and Hoshi, but Machi was lost to Buntaro's forces. Richard gladly would go back and retake the territory, but he was busy rebuilding and refortifying the towns and villages Buntaro had already savaged. Machi, unfortunately, would just have to wait. As the warmth of summer left and the brisk chill of autumn set in, the soldiers of Buntaro all felt relatively comfortable with the fact that Richard would not be ready to retake this town. They were often out watching for any sign of an army or a knight with samurai surrounding him. But what they saw walking through the rain of colorful leaves was a man in orange and black robes as if licked by fire and adorned in a straw hat. An Aramusha, if ever they'd seen one. A Ronin. Who goes there? An Orochi called. I am Akikaze, the watch replied. Akikaze Ichizo, the Orochi blinked. Akikaze, he called. I'm unfamiliar with that clan. I do not hail from any clan, he answered. Open your doors at once so I may bring justice upon the fool Buntaro's underlings. This insult sent waves of anger through the Orochi who drew their longbows. If you don't hail from a clan, then you have no authority over anyone here, Ronin. And you have no authority over me, he replied. For I am the autumn rain, falling leaves of crimson, to coat the blood-soaked ground of my enemies. The Orochi left their post to contend with the intruder themselves, and in doing so, they opened the gate. This was their first and final mistake, as the autumn wind rushed them with the fury and force of a gale. The twin blades met flesh and severed bones. The first Orochi was dead before he'd pulled its katana, and the second tried to rush, but the other blade found his hand and removed it with a simple swipe. A Shugoki was right behind them. He swung his massive club only for both swords to strike it back with a blade blockade, both swords crashing together to send back the wooden instrument. The Aramusha then sank to one knee, dragging his steel down with him as they detached the Shugoki's massive head from his shoulders. Not once could the soldiers see the face of their foe, as his face was hidden behind the hat he wore. The alarm was sounded and pikemen, Nobushi, and even Kyoshin or two ran to apprehend and kill the disgraced Ronin. Ichizo smiled as they came. Though the leaves that rained about him floated and drifted atop his hat, his clothes, and his steel, never did a single leaf meet damage from his strikes, as if he were nothing but a wind passing by. Though this cutting wind left only blood in its wake. At last, one soldier laying on his back with his leg amputated at the knee looked up at his killer, seeing the face of the Aramusha. You're Tachibana Ichizo! I told you, I am Akikaze the autumn wind. He then sunk his blade into the horrified Kyoshin. Buntaro and Blackthorn both received word two days later of Machi being claimed by a Ronin. 
Only one shinobi had escaped the battle to warn Buntaro of this ronin who called himself Akikaze Ichizo. The name meant nothing to Buntaro, another feckless and disgraced samurai touting a title and name that he did not carry. And yet Blackthorn only smiled at it. Tachibana Ichizo had fallen like an autumn leaf in Izu, only to rise again as Akikaze. Now where the crimson and fiery leaves reign, so too travels a man with no restrictions or chains to fetter him. A wild wind that moves across the mire and Heathmore with twin swords that taste the blood of those he thinks are deserving. A figure finally torn from disgrace by his own strength of will. Though, on occasion, it stops a while to share tea with a black dragon in the mire, from whom he was not bound, but eternally grateful.